Welcome, everyone. My name is Esther Lee, yeah, President of Chinese American Heritage Foundation. We are very excited to get a tour of San Diego Chinese Historical Museum and also learn about San Diego State University Chinese Cultural Center. Now, let me introduce Dr. Lily Chang, who is a scholar. She is the founder, director of the San Diego State I'm on mute now, right? Chinese Culture Center. Dr. Chang has a long history of advocacy for the San Diego API community, having served, for example, as the chair of the International Affairs Board of the City of San Diego, of the Mayor's Asian Pacific Advisory Board of San Diego, and of the Asian Pacific Historical Thematic District. She is the current chairperson of the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum's Board of Directors. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Chen. Yes, thank you, Esther. Thank you all. Today, we celebrate this whole month, Asian Heritage Month. And I am very happy uh, to serve uh, as one of the hosts. And uh, here from San Diego State University, we like to show you a very short tour of the, uh, the Chinese Culture Center. And then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Bob Stein to do an actual live tour of the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. So please let us show you the Chinese Cultural Center, a virtual tour. Thank you. Welcome to the Chinese Cultural Center of San Diego State University. Behind me is the great teacher of China, Confucius. Confucius started talking about how to be a good human being. And he taught us many, many things. I'd like to share the first idea that he presented, which is called Li. That is how we should treat people with respect and with humility. Li is very important in China. We do it very easily by showing you a good gesture like this. He also talked about Yue, which is music. We think it's very important that we fill our lives with music. A few decades ago, this entire set of musical bells was discovered in the province of Hubei. When people discovered this whole piece, they couldn't figure out what this whole piece was about until they found some actual musical notes. So this is music demonstrated by hitting different parts of the bells different sounds will come out. So this is a way to show different music. Music is very important part of the Chinese Cultural Center. One part of the development of a human being is to develop his inner energy. And this is done through the exercise such as Tai Chi. And this area, the space is wide open for us to practice Tai Chi. And the Chinese Cultural Center provides Tai Chi classes for our students, faculty, and staff, and also visitors. Tea is a very important part of the Chinese culture. The Chinese people use a cup of tea to show their welcome, to also develop human relationships. This is very crucial to understand. The Chinese Cultural Center offers you a great cup of tea. Enjoy. Calligraphy is a very important part of the Chinese culture. Here at the Chinese Culture Center, we showcase a piece of calligraphy with carving 
and also poetry and also lacquer, a combination of many forms of arts into one piece. The Abacus is a Chinese national treasure. 2,000 years ago, Mr. Liu Hong invented the abacus. It is also a world heritage. Most Chinese people enjoy learning the abacus. I hope you've enjoyed the virtual tour of the Chinese Cultural Center at San Diego State University. The Terracotta Soldier and I bid you farewell. Now, it gives me great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Bob Stein, the director of the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. He is on site and he's gonna give you a grand tour. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Take it over, thank you. Hi folks, I'm so happy to talk to you folks and I hope you can hear me. And uh, I'm uh, the acting director of the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. And behind us, we have the museum. And when we go inside, we're going to see some pictures of it in a completely different light. This building was built in the 1920s by uh, uh, the Chinese community and uh, Congregationalist missionaries uh, who had come here from New England. And uh, the building served as a church and as a uh, meeting hall and as a dormitory and when the church got too big for this building it moved and the building went to a variety of owners it was about to be torn down in the 1990s when some civic-minded people in san diego said we've got to preserve it and it was uh, moved two blocks to this site and uh, the san diego chinese historical museum was born and so we're going to walk inside and we're going to see a few things that we have uh, inside, and we're gonna see a bunch of interesting pictures of the museum back in the 1930s. So let's walk this way. Here we are inside the front door, and uh, we're going to uh, walk over and see our first display which is of uh, herbalist Chinese medicine in the early 1900s. And we have a very interesting object to show you. So let's walk over here. What we have is a homemade uh, redwood uh, herb box made by an early Chinese herbalist who after he left the area, left this in a store a block away, which became a pie shop. And the owner finally said, what are we gonna do with this? The museum was born and he donated it to us. And it's exactly as it was when the herbalist left. And I'm gonna just randomly grab a uh, drawer and open it. And inside the drawer are herbs as, uh, as collated and as left by the herbalist back in the day. And uh, you look at this and you think how quaint that is, but you realize, or you should realize, that many of the drugs uh, that we use today are basically derivatives of herbs, uh, including uh, aspirin, which comes from the bark of the willow tree, uh, uh, quinine treatment for malaria comes from the cinchona bush, uh, uh, vincristine for a treatment of lymphoma comes from the Madagascar periwinkle and uh, new diabetes drugs called SGLT2 inhibitors comes from the bark of the apple tree. So uh, this is uh, all actually much more current than you might think. The American Medical Association fought the herbalists tooth and nail because the, the Californians loved these people more than their own Western doctors, since the Western doctors back in the day would do things like surgery without antibiotics, which would often be fatal, and would do uh, uh, bloodletting and purgatives and all sorts of other 
toxic therapeutics, the Chinese did nothing but give uh, herbs that may have had significant value or acupuncture, which also uh, uh, had value. Uh, we're gonna go from this to, uh, from herbs, we're gonna go from this to the afterlife, which is an interesting um, uh, A to Z comparison. I'm gonna stand right here. And uh, Chris, who's, the, who's doing uh, the photography right now, I'm gonna ask him to uh, go to his right and look at this replica of a jade, of a jade uh, a costume for a deceased. And uh, this is a replica, but thousands of years old. And uh, this is a representative of uh, the early use of jade. Uh, at the San Diego Museum of Art, we have objects that are 5,000 years old found in tombs in China made of jade. So jade was a, uh, an object that was felt to have value and magical properties and was able to help the deceased uh, 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 after death uh, uh, regarding uh, spirits and regarding uh, long-term happiness. And we have a lot of objects here from uh, tombs that were gathered. And behind me, if we can just look right over here, we have a Tang Dynasty uh, polo player. And uh, the idea was that in death, you would need everything that you needed in life. If you played polo in life, you would play polo in death. If you had a, a dog or a cat, you would have a dog or a cat uh, in death. If you did cooking, you would need a knife, you would need water pans, you would need cooking utensils. There are bronze dings that uh, were found, three-legged uh, cooking uh, instruments that were found in tombs. And all of this would be uh, because of filial piety and reverence for ancestors, which then was codified by Confucius in 500 BCE. Although Confucius merely codified behavior that preceded Confucius, interestingly. And as I mentioned, things like uh, uh, the, the bronze items and the jade items were in the Shang Dynasty and were pre-dynastic, pre-biblical, uh, 5,000 years ago. We also have uh, here uh, representatives of the uh, various religions of China. We have this portable uh, shrine that has an image of Buddha inside. And this will be carried by people in processions with poles on either side. Uh, and uh, it would be uh, carried in reverence. And next door to the shrine, we have uh, everybody's favorite uh, demigod. We have Guan Yin, the goddess of compassion in Buddhism. And uh, we have a beautiful stone replica of Guan Yin. And next to that, we have a stone head of a Buddha that uh, is over a thousand years old and found in a grotto in Northwest China. And next to that, we have a Taoist uh, uh, god uh, right here, as evidenced by the hand mudra uh, symbols and by the headdress. And uh, Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism being the three, uh, three main religions, all dating to about 500 BCE, with Confucianism, as Lily mentioned, uh, about uh, uh, interpersonal uh, relations and uh, happiness interpersonally, parents, children, uh, uh, siblings, work, and the like. Uh, Buddhism talking about uh, eternal happiness and breaking the cycle of uh, birth, death, and rebirth. Uh, and Taoism about traversing uh, the vicissitudes of life in as uh, perfect a way as possible with the opposite of wet and dry, yin and yang, in an effortless way to uh, get through life for health, happiness, and security. And over here, we have a, uh, uh, a, a god guarding the door of a temple. Uh, and, um, and behind us, uh, Chris, if you want to just have a glance, we have a beautiful, uh, a beautiful representation of the Chinese dynasties 
from uh, Neolithic times all the way up uh, through uh, the birth of the Chinese Republic in 1912 with Dr. Sun. And then over here, we have a display of uh, Chinese crafts and folk art, uh, including, uh, including um, Koizune, including jade objects. And on the other side, Chris, if you can take a look, we have uh, embroidery, we have paper uh, cuttings, and we also have, uh, have classes in paper cuttings for kids, by the way, in our educational program. And over here, we have a collection of snuff bottles, snuff being introduced to China by the West, and the idea being this powdered tobacco was uh, healthful. If you put a bit in your nose and you sneeze, it would improve your health. And the snuff bottles then became objects uh, that were prized. They would be carved in various shapes, made out of various substances, and then given as gifts. Uh, San Diego, if you're watching from elsewhere in the country, became actually a, uh, a center for a period of time regarding snuff bottles for China, believe it or not, because uh, the Dowager Empress uh, loved tourmaline. And where was the largest tourmaline uh, mine uh, in the United States? Right here in San Diego, about uh, 30 minutes north of here in uh, Mount Palomar. And, uh, and uh, literally tons would be mined each year and it would come in various colors. She, uh, regarding the, uh, the Taoist thinking, she preferred the pink feminine color and men might prefer the green. And uh, tourmaline became a, an enormous hit for a variety for buttons and clothing items and snuff bottles. And sad to say, when the Dowager Empress died in, I think, 1911, uh, the uh, demand for tourmaline vanished just like that. So over here, we have a uh, bridal bed uh, that was owned by a Chinese warlord in the early 20th century, and we're fortunate to have it. We have it foreshortened for space considerations. And then just over to uh, your left, we have this lovely diorama of a Chinese grocery store and mercantile called Wu Chi Chang. And when I came to San Diego in the 1970s, we shopped at Wu Chi Chang, but it wasn't at this site. This site is actually down the street from this museum. This museum is in the center of the old San Diego at 3rd and J. The water is just a, a few uh, hundred yards that way. And uh, there were fish, Chinese fishing uh, camps uh, right over there and dotting the waterfront. And Wu Chi Chang's had moved from this site to a different neighborhood where I shopped. I had no idea at the time that its origins were here. We have this beautiful diorama of the store. It ultimately closed in the 1990s. Over here, we have a bit on Chinese laundry, which was not only an early occupation of Chinese immigrants, because it required very little overhead. You just needed soap, you needed water, you didn't have to know English. Uh, the uh, uh, benefit of the laundry was that after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, excluding uh, new uh, Chinese from coming to America, an exemption would be if you were a merchant class. And so how do they define merchant? Laundry. So this became a coveted thing. So a laborer, uh, no. Laundry worker, yes. So we have a variety of artifacts from the Chinese laundry industry in San Diego. There were over a hundred. There's still a couple left, but most are gone. I'm gonna walk this way and we have more dioramas. And over here, we have a photo of, we have a photo of our museum on wheels. And uh, this is it, when it was the Chinese uh, uh, mission church. And it was two blocks away from here. And it was moved on wheels uh, in the uh, 1990s uh, to its current site after it was threatened with demolition. And many uh, uh, thoughtful uh, citizens said this can't be done. And a woman named Sally Wong, Avery, and uh, the Hams 
uh, uh, Dorothy Hamm uh, saved the museum and uh, as it is now, and we are so fortunate to have it. And here's the front of it. You can see uh, a bunch of people from the 1930s uh, in front of the museum. And instead of saying a uh, museum, it says uh, San Diego Chinese Mission on the top. So very, very cool. Over here, I want to show you some artifacts that were excavated uh, archaeologically. So when people would do excavation and build new apartments and so forth here as the neighborhoods were torn down and transformed, they would find artifacts from early settling and the artifacts would be given to our museum. And we have transformed this into one of the children's activities. We have a uh, archaeological activity for kids. We have a large sandbox and we bury actually authentic, accurate uh, items that were dug up uh, in the early 1900s for the kids to find. And then they can try to uh, imagine what sort of society people had lived in based on things that they've uncovered. We have things related to gambling over here. And we have uh, pots, pans, bottles, and utensils on the other side. Over here, we have another diorama which describes the, uh, 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 the history of Chinese in California and particularly San Diego, starting in the 1840s with the gold rush in Northern California at Sutter's Mill. And then after that played out with the uh, railroad construction and the golden spike at Promontory Point was in the 1860s. And then after that played out in uh, fishing and uh, the Chinese uh, single-handedly altered the uh, gustatory tastes of Californians who went from meat and uh, fowl to fish because of the Chinese fishing. And uh, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act and overfishing, by around 1900 in San Diego, the last of the Chinese fishing fleet was gone. We have a diorama of that in a minute. And uh, this includes other things that include some, uh, uh, some native uh, people from San Diego, Murray Lee and Tom Hom. Murray Lee has written a definitive book about the history of uh, China, uh, Chinese immigration in San Diego called In Search of Gold Mountain. Uh, and over behind us, uh, we have a diorama of one of the fishing villages. And as you can see, uh, there are hundreds of abalones drying on tables. And here are the boats. Um, and, uh, and these abalones would be dried and would then be uh, uh, packed in canvas sacks and shipped. And again, as I mentioned, abalone was overfished. And over here we have actual abalone and a shell that you can take a picture of, Chris. Um, right over here. Uh, and we have antique wheelbarrow and we have a small store right over here as well. Um, at this point, uh, if we have time, uh, uh, you can tell me how we're doing on time. We can uh, walk into the back and we can have questions and answers. So we're happy to entertain questions and answers. And uh, in the back, we have uh, some statuary, we have Confucius, we have uh, eight Taoist immortals, we have some uh, replicas of uh, the Xi'an terracotta warriors. So if there are questions, we'd be happy to entertain them right now. Does anybody say? Anything? I'm not hearing anything. Uh, there is uh, one in the chat. Um, I just want to talk about cultural classes for kids, how many yes. different classes do you have, which is the most uh, popular? Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, answer a question about uh, classes for kids. Uh, number one, we offer a variety of things. Uh, and we have uh, this very lovely talk that we do at the beginning of the year on the Chinese New Year. And it's not only about the Chinese New Year, but it also is a bit of comparative uh, sociology where we chat about uh, the different kinds of calendars people have, 
Uh, we talk about people mastering two, three, four, five calendars every day. We challenge the kids to think of the calendars that they use every day. They use their school calendar. They may use a sports calendar. They may use their regular Western calendar. And if they're Chinese, they may use a Chinese calendar. If they're Jewish, they may use a Jewish uh, calendar. If they are Muslim, they may use an Islamic calendar. It's amazing. Uh, if they're Persian, Persians use three calendars every day. They use uh, a Persian calendar, a Muslim calendar, and a Western calendar. So we talk about that. We talk about comparative uh, events. Uh, we have uh, a wonderful uh, talk about uh, uh, Chinese scientific inventions, and we have one about the first emperor, we have an array of talks, and then we have events too, hands-on things. I mentioned the archaeological dig, and we have uh, tours of the museum, and then we also have other things, paper cutting, and we have uh, some wonderful volunteers who do uh, calligraphy and teach kids uh, elementary calligraphy, uh, how to hold the brush and uh, uh, and uh, simple calligraphy, which is very, very cool. So we have that. And if there are other questions, because I'm not getting sound, I'm not getting anything from the earphones, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So it'd be best to put it in the chat box, I suppose. You know. Shall we walk and take a look at, uh, at the, our uh, garden? Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through, we're gonna walk by a display of World War II and uh, minorities always try to prove their, uh, their patriotism and the uh, Chinese Americans are no different. And these are a variety of medals from uh, uh, people uh, from San Diego in World War II. Um, and we're going to walk back uh, through the door And we have an antique sewing machine that we're walking back. There's actually a functional sewing machine in it. And uh, if I may show, we actually have a sewing machine here uh, used uh, in a uh, Chinese uh, uh, tailor shop from 1916. Believe it or not, it's been electrified, but uh, I recall my grandfather using a, a very similar model. So here we are in our backyard and we have, uh, we have a, a terracotta warrior here. We have Confucius right behind me. Uh, we have jacaranda blossoms on the ground, if you want to look at those, Chris. And um, we have the uh, eight Taoist immortals uh, over here along this path along the side. And so uh, it's a very lovely little area, which we enjoy, uh, which we enjoy uh, showing off to people very much. So. Uh, at this point, I think it's reasonable to uh, thank everyone uh, uh, for this uh, tour. We are going to show you our annex across the way where we, are, where we have rotating exhibits. And we currently have a beautiful Chinese painting exhibit uh, of artwork collected by an ambassador to Taiwan of the United States named Ambassador Drumwright. He and his wife collected art and donated it to our Good Luck, our museum. And we have a, uh, an exhibit right this minute. Oh, and also thank you. And uh, we have a performance by Henry Tang, uh, our, one of our, uh, uh, one of, one of our uh, museum uh, employees. He's actually the head of operations of the museum. And he's gonna do a lovely storytelling exhibit and uh, he looks, uh, you're going to be impressed just to look at him, he looks extremely distinguished. So, uh, so that's it. Okay, so I want to thank everybody for their attention. And, and Henry, if you're able to, you can start anytime. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Henry Tan. 
Today I'm telling you the traditional Chinese story time, Beijing Ting Shu. The story is about three kingdoms, Red Cliffs, July 5th, 208 AD. Prime Minister Cao Cao commands thousands of new forces, conquering a thousand warlords, Liu Bei and Sun Quan. At the Red Cliff on Yangtze River, they encountered and fought the most famous naval battle in ancient Chinese history. Today, allow me to retell the story. Jiang 上至孙权下至士族而狼一边百姓吃不下饭睡不着觉你的兄长孙策孙伯虎临终之时托伏于你啊Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the Chinese storytelling. At this juncture, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Bob Stein to come over to our annex, and uh, he is going to help us show you the beautiful exhibit of Ambassador and Mrs. Florence Drumright. Take it over, Bob. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, I want to introduce. Uh, some of the artwork, as well as uh, my colleague who seems to have walked away, uh, uh, Linda de Benedetto. And uh, what I'm going to do is, while she's coming back, uh, I'm going to ask Chris to sort of pan this room. We have several rooms of art, and uh, it's all beautiful. And uh, we're going to start with some calligraphy by none other than Chiang Kai-shek the uh, head of the Kuomintang from 1920s until he died in what, 1976. Uh, Linda, would you like to say a couple words about this? And Chris, if you want to come around, it's on the left. Uh, it's the calligraphy that we're chatting about. Linda? Okay, 
So what we're looking at here is um, calligraphy done by Chiang Kai-shek, who was president of the Republic of China when um, Ambassador Drumright and his wife Florence were there. And let me point out, um, Chiang Kai-shek, in order to be a good leader, thought that benevolence was important. And he's chosen to put this symbol of benevolence, which you see on the right-hand side of, the, of this calligraphy, on red paper, which red paper is very important in Chinese culture. And if you look at this character, on the left is a symbol for a person, and then on the right is the number two. So what he's saying is that it takes two people or two sides for benevolence. And he thinks that's an important character for a leader to have, and also for the people, it works two ways. So um, Chiang Kai-shek's wife was an artist, and uh, so was Mrs. Drumright. And so consequently, the Drumrights were introduced to some of the best contemporary Chinese artists of, of, at the time. And when he left his ambassadorship in the um, 60s, it moved to San Diego, they kept in touch with their friends from China. And when he died, his widow Florence left a large number of, of paintings from their collection, which are done by some of the most important Chinese painters of the 20th century. We can look at one right over here, which is these horses. This was, in this, in this gallery, all the artwork is done by um, members of the, the uh, government of the Republic of China. And this was a government official, but look at the skill that he has in his artwork. The horses are, com are really, composed of just sections that are not even joined in places. And yet we get the essence of the horse and we get the spirit of the horses. Notice all four hooves are off the ground. They're sort of flying and they're flying together. They're even talking to each other and giving us this sense of, of power and strength, but at the same time, happiness and uh, just community with others. So um, this painting is by Chiang Kai-shek's wife, Sun Mei Ling. And she was very, uh, very interested in traditional Chinese landscape painting. And she had teachers that taught her the uh, method of the old masters. And you can see this uh, vertical, uh, landscape in the typical Chinese form. She also introduced Florence Drumright to her teachers who taught Florence. The next gallery has works by the teachers. In this corner, you notice these two paintings that are very similar. They're of wisteria. One is by the teacher and one is by Florence Drumright. And if you have a, a really a practiced eye, you might be able to tell that immediate. Uh, my, I, I only know it because I know that this one is the teacher and this one is Florence Drumright. So in addition to the teachers, the next gallery has art that was, was given to the Drumrights by their artist friends. And one of those is a portrait of Mrs. Drumright. Notice that while well, we've seen in, this, in these galleries, the paintings were very traditional Chinese done with brush and ink. Here we have a very contemporary, um, multicolored painting, in fact, a lot of colors, bright colors in oil on canvas. And look at how he's captured Mrs. Drumright. Her eyes show you a vivacious woman who is confident and yet, and yet soft and approachable. 
the background is splashes of color with lots of brush strokes that are, part, are very reminiscent of the American art uh, movement of um, abstract expressionism, but they don't overwhelm her. Her eyes and her blonde hair and her, and her presence make her the focus of the painting. Even, even um, the heavy outlines and the splotches of color on her dress just add to um, the idea that this is a strong, confident woman, but we know from, from her facial features and her eyes and that little smile she has that um, she was very approachable. And that's, that is very much the symbol of what the drum lights meant to accomplish by having a, a cross-cultural exchange and maintaining friends of, of both cultures. Right. And now, no, no, sorry, no. I, I was, I'm just thinking, Linda, I was going to thank Linda for the wonderful job that she did. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with that first room where you have uh, executives of Chiang Kai-shek's government, who, just like the ancient uh, Chinese civil servants, uh, ethos uh, is uh, to be a successful government service person, you need to know art, you need to know calligraphy, you uh, need to know poetry, and uh, here it is true in the 1960s. It's amazing. So at this point, again, I want to thank Linda. You did a great job and with very little preparation. So uh, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, uh, Lily Chang, who's going to uh, offer a few uh, final words. And I want to thank everybody for this. Yes, I want to thank Bob and Linda and, of course, Chris Chen for making this possible uh, to actually do the virtual tour of the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. It is located downtown San Diego on the premise of the old Chinatown, and it's on the corner of 3rd and J on two sides of 3rd and J. And we welcome all of you here. Uh, when you get to San Diego. Please do not forget to come and visit us. I also want to take this moment to thank Wilson and Astor Lee uh, from the Chinese American Heritage Foundation for upholding our heritage, for upholding our spirits, and for our great collaboration to celebrate May the Asian Heritage Month. So I'm going to turn it over to Esther, please. Lily, don't turn off your camera. I really want to thank you for taking your time with your team, Chris and Dr. Steen, for doing an amazing job. Um, that was a great virtual tool. Let me put Chris back in here. Chris, yeah, thank you for the virtual tool. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Steen. <laughs> yeah, that 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 was that was amazing. I'm sorry, I forgot the lady's name. I apologize. The the lady that I talk about the artwork. Yeah, she, she is amazing too. Oh, you are muted, Lily. <laughs> Linda. Linda. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. So um also, yeah, the how long does it take um you to like get all these artwork? The artwork, all like, of them. Like, like, is it gradually you improved it or or it, like you just get a bunch in a certain period of time? Okay, so let's talk about the mission building. The artwork of the building was donated to us by the Chinese uh, uh, community. It was, right. uh, the building was going to be actually demolished and uh -huh. we went uh, uh, to save the building. So that building, was given to us by the uh -huh. Chinese community. Right. And uh, the artifacts, many of them were given to us actually after the excavation because downtown San Diego, where the Chinatown used to be, uh, you know, the, the, that area has become now hustle bustle with the beautiful uh, uh, stores and beautiful hotels. So when they did the excavation, they found some of the stuff. And so they gave them to us. And then the laundry was given to us, the, the artifacts of the laundry, 
uh, was given to us very kindly by the Wong Lee family. They, uh, they actually operated one of the last laundries in Chinatown, in, in San Diego. There were at one time more than 118 Chinese laundries because wow. uh, that was really the only thing the Chinese could do. Uh, mm -hmm. was to the laundry. And wow. then many of the other uh, items that you uh, that uh, Dr. Stein talked about uh, were donated by the veterans, the veterans oh. that, uh, uh, that uh, serve the Second World War, either on the Pacific Theater or on the Atlantic Theater. So they gave us some of the items. And mm -hmm. then of course, some of the other items, the museum purchased or they were donated to us. So that's the mission side. The right. drum ride exhibition, the entire exhibition uh, was given to us by Mrs. Florence Drumright. The entire wow. exhibition. Oh, so I see. So if you okay. come to see the exhibition now, every single piece on our extension was given to us by Mrs. Drumright. And then when Mrs. Drumright and uh, Ambassador Drumright, when they were in Taiwan, uh, uh, Mr. Ev Everett Drumright served as the US ambassador to then the Republic of China on Taiwan. Uh, they became a friends with many of the artists. So the artists gave the Drumrights many of the pieces, mm. including a piece uh, given to us by Madame Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Mrs. Uh, Song Mei Ling. And she did a piece uh, of the, 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 the painting and Chiang Kai-shek uh, did the writing. So the husband and the wife team gave us that painting through the generosity of Mrs. Drumright. So oh, this, exhibit, this exhibit is absolutely unbelievable, including the, the Picasso of China, uh, uh, Zhang Daqian, his work is also exhibited here. So mm -hmm. we welcome anyone and everyone to come to our museum to see this tremendous, phenomenal exhibit. Hmm. So that leads to one of our question is, would you by any chance know how long it take Madame Jiang Kai-shek to paint the landscape painting? Oh, I wouldn't know, uh, but I do know that Madame Chiang Kai-shek spent a lot of her time learning uh, the Chinese painting and she uh, was meticulous in her work. Of course, many of her pieces are exhibited in different parts of the world. And so it probably would take her uh, quite a bit of time to do a piece, especially when she was uh, planning this peach piece, she was thinking about giving it to Mrs. Uh, Florence Drumright, who right. was a very good friend, and also to incorporate her husband's uh, calligraphy in there. So the yeah. whole thing must have taken more than a week or two weeks. Right, right. Wow, I mean, that's a very nice painting. And yes. I have to be honest with you, I haven't been to your museum yet. Yeah, yes. and, and I'm sure there'll be, you know, a lot more details than I can see, even though the virtual tour is very detailed, Chris. So thank you so much. And um, I think everybody was just enjoying watching it, but don't have too much question. So um, again, I also want to thank um, Henry for the performance. It's very interesting. Yes, um, maybe we can ask Henry to come over uh, sure. to, be, uh, to be absolutely sure that we make the proper introduction. Henry, please join us. Yes, Henry Tang, whose Chinese name is Tang Fan, just joined the Chinese Historical Museum as the operations manager. So we not only have a manager, but we also have a talented storyteller. And of course, I want to be sure to invite Chris Chen to come in and say hello. Chris, <laughs> tell us who you really are. Who I really am. <laughs> well, I have been, uh, to tell you the truth, I have been, uh, uh, had the pleasure of, of uh, spending time with uh, Lily here uh, this area is the Chinese historic district, and so uh, whenever there was a, a Chinese New Year fair or festival, Lunar New Year festival, uh, Lily and I would be emceeing together. I was a television reporter, and so we would always want to be in the community, and um, you know, as part of my heritage, obviously. Uh, so it was wonderful to to meet Lily, and now I'm working in at the the city of San Diego uh, as uh, communications for the San Diego City Council, mm -hmm. and I am trying to take a more active role in uh, the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. So that's why you're seeing me a little bit more now. I just want to take uh, more time to contribute. 
Yeah, and I would love can't wait to come to Boston to, to go and visit uh, visit with you and and especially Please. family. Please, history. very welcome. Yeah, yeah, great job. I mean, um, so can I go back to one of the question? Oh, I guess there are question before. Um, okay, did the first lady ever return to Taiwan? I understand she passed in the U.S. Yes, uh, I want to answer that question. Madame Chiang Kai-shek left Taiwan and was residing in, the, in New York uh, in a huge, beautiful uh, residence in, um, in Long Island. And later on, she moved into the city. She moved to downtown Manhattan and stayed in a penthouse in Manhattan. She actually passed away in the United States at the age of 106 and she really never returned to Taiwan once she settled in the United States of America, where she went to school uh, as a young girl, and she eventually graduated from Wellesley in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And um, uh, Wilson had put in a comment, which I absolutely agree. We never realized that San Diego has such a rich Chinese, Chinese American history. And people, you know, always talk about San Francisco and Los Angeles because, you know, they're big city. But, you know, so it, it's great that we do this um, webinar so that people know that you guys also have a big exhibit that, you know, we should come and visit and, and see so we won't miss. Yes. And also, thank you for the comment. Uh, besides San Francisco, New York, uh, maybe Chicago and possibly Boston, San Diego, San Diego had a vibrant Chinese uh, community. The Chinatown uh, was actually inhabited by a lot of fishermen, as Dr. Stein talked about. They were the abalone catchers. They were the shrimp catchers. They, they caught a lot of the seafood and they dried them up and they sent them back to Canton, to China. So we have had a very strong fishing industry by the Chinese. Also, San Diego is our frontier. San Diego is in Baja California. And so south, south of San Diego is actually Tijuana and then Baja California, Mexico. And in Mexico, we have so many Chinese Mexicans in south of us. And that part of history is also absolutely wonderful and crucial. So besides the, the gold mines, besides the building of the railroads, the Chinese were here and they created what we call today the Chinatown. And Dr. Bob, do you have anything to add to this question? Uh, only to say that I've learned a lot of this stuff uh, since I've joined the museum and, uh, uh, and read Murray Lee's book mm -hmm. and you couldn't be more right. Uh, San Diego has a very rich uh, Chinese history and uh, it's uh, lots of fun. So we encourage people uh, when they're in San Diego to give us a call in advance and we'll give you guys a tour. Yeah, and I think it's a great idea as I, the question that I raised about classes, I think it's a great idea to share this history with different classes that you guys hold, as you said, on Friday. And do you also hold classes on Saturday as well? We, uh, we, we have uh, classes for kids mm. right. uh, the, during the school year. We also have on Saturday, occasionally on Sunday, uh, a course every month uh, called the uh, Chinese American Experience and Beyond. And it's on an array of topics from uh, Lily herself gave this several part top, uh, topic on uh, Chinese ceramics over 5,000 years. And we've had uh, uh, topics on uh, everything you can think of. Um, and uh, we have one coming up on a gentleman's research on the people who flew a B-24 bomber uh, in World War II and uh, the varied people on it, uh, Chinese Americans and so forth and so on. We've had over the last two years a four parts, soon to be five, and ending at six part on uh, Jewish experience in China from uh, the uh, World War II Shanghai uh, uh, experience where China took in uh, 20,000 uh, European Jews to Middle Ages and Middle Eastern and Indian and 
Iraqi uh, Jews. It's uh, an interesting topic done by an array of different speakers. So we've had, a, it's been a lot of fun. And Lily herself has been the main force behind it. Mm -hmm. Well, that will lead to our next question. Do you work with Chinese Mexican organization across the border uh, from San Diego? Yes, we do. In fact, mm. the, uh, the, the society, historical society, uh, was actually called the, uh, the San Diego uh, 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 Historical Society of Baja California. So yes, we do. We have uh, a lot of communication and visitors coming from Baja California. Of course, during the COVID, uh, the museum was shut down and our right. visitors haven't been coming over. Yes, we do. And we also have uh, in the Central Valley, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Mexican background, Mexican uh, Chinese background uh, individuals, and they uh, also visit us. So, so we are trying to tell the story as a whole, rather than San Diego. We tell the story of Baja California. And you probably also have to know this, that the Chinese were the ones that helped to actually build the irrigation system for farming in Baja California. The Chinese uh, uh, workers made that happen. So today, if you are eating a, a nice piece of fruit from Baja California, it's very likely that some Chinese had made it possible for the irrigation system to take place. Mm -hmm. So um, during pandemic, were, were you able to hold classes um, online? Since yeah. you say the museum were closed. Yes, yes, we had such fantastic Zoom meetings and uh, Dr. Bob Stein has been serving as our sort of uh, res uh, moder uh, moderator in residence. He has been helping us and we've had thousands of people joining us through the Zoom. Mm -hmm. We have had topics as, uh, as uh, Bob mentioned uh, about the Jews in China, the Jewish communities in Shanghai, uh, uh, pieces about porcelain, Chinese acupuncture, the stories about Chinatown San Francisco, and stories about Chinatown San Diego. And we also uh, have gone from the Palace Museum in Beijing all the way down to uh, the uh, artifacts of San Diego, the laundries and the, the Chinese school. So we are continuing on this summer. We will have many wonderful programs coming up. In fact, I need to advertise not only for the June uh, talk, but also the July. In the July talk, we're going to talk about Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, how these isms impact our well-being and health and our pursuit of happiness. And we want to invite everybody to join us uh, in, in the summertime to enjoy the July program as well. And you can look online and you can get the link for it. Um, yeah. Curious. So I guess my question, yeah. Um, so uh, now that your museum is open, so will you still consider have the online so that other people get used to joining you guys will still be able to learn from you guys? The, the online experience is actually different. And uh, anybody who's watched uh, the online Zoom business grow in the last two years, we can do things that we couldn't otherwise do. We've had, I think, two lectures by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Van Neck Yoder uh, who lives in Holland. Uh, we've had uh, another lecture by uh, two people in Heidelberg, Germany with a discussion in New York City and other people in Los Angeles. I mean, these things couldn't ever be possible uh, in the old days. And mm -hmm. so uh, we, we can't abandon that. This is Great. Uh, clearly going to be a permanent part of the landscape. And uh, yeah. it's a lot of fun. Uh, yes. We have no limitation. Yeah. and speakers. The sky is the limit at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then we had a speaker from Costa Rica and uh, we had uh, speakers uh, from England. We had a speaker from uh, uh, Jerusalem and Haifa. So wow. we have been able to connect everywhere. We have people coming in, joining us from Canada. And uh -huh. of course we want people from Boston. We have had people from Boston joining us as well. So this program called the Chinese American Experience and Beyond, we, we want to invite everybody to join us across the globe. And also we want to also for people to tell us what they're interested in so we can invite them. So of mm -hmm. course, Esther and Wilson 
you're on our list, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Can't wait to visit you. So mm -hmm. it's um five o'clock. So it's um the yeah. end of the webinar. Uh, time passes by so fast. Love to chat with you guys another time and in person. So thank you so much for presentation, performance, everything. Uh, the virtual tour, it's wonderful. So thank you for your time and thank you for all the attendees. So we still have a few more days of webinar. Uh, so please visit us at cahf.us. And if you have a chance, don't forget to go to San Diego and visit Lily and Chris and Dr. Stain. Yes. So thank you very thank much. You. Have a nice evening. Yes, nice afternoon for us. Yep. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.